Patrice Balmel. How are you, sir? Good, how are you, Paul? I'm good, mate. I'm good. I'm good. I'm a little bit too suntanned for my own good, if I'm being honest. I'm, I'm looking a bit pink. I mean, you had a little bit of celebrating going on yesterday, maybe, in the sun. Yeah, a little bit, a little bit. <laughs> Although the news didn't come through till late, so, you know, there was fireworks. Oh, I might have yeah, drank a whole yeah. bottle of Prosecco to myself. Yeah, awesome. Well, you know, I was super, super stoked. Because, you know, it's such a sentimental favorite for anyone outside of England. <laughs> yeah, that's what surprises a lot of people within England that Liverpool seems to be like the kind of the, the team that pulls at a lot of people's heartstrings. Because you're you're obviously German, right? So I am, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And do you have a, do you have a German team that you support? Um, internationally, Bayern Munich, because they're the only one who actually, you know, plays some decent football at the moment <laughs> or consistently. <laughs> But yeah, I remember back in the days, uh, back in the 80s, when I was a kid, uh, I remember the Liverpool from the day because my dad was a Liverpool fan as well. No so way. I remember the Ian Rush and Groblas and Douglas and all those guys. Uh, up to Heisel, I remember everything. And then the tragedy happened and it probably set the club back two decades at least. Mm. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and then obviously what happened four years afterwards with Hillsborough and stuff as well. And how yeah. that was just a massive thing as well. And, you know, it's been an epic journey to get back to this point. It really, really has. So if your dad was a Liverpool supporter, does that mean we can claim you as an honorary scouser? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll send the papers. I'll, I'll uh, get you the scouse passport for the next oh, time you come over. Oh, yeah. Get me a ticket. Oh, absolutely, dude. <laughs> absolutely. You fit right in, dude. You're one of us. You're one of us. You're one of us. So, obviously, you're coming at us from Amsterdam, which has been your home for a long time. So long, I think most people think you're actually Dutch. Yeah. Yeah, I am East German, but uh, uh, I moved to Amsterdam 25 years ago now. And, yeah, this is my home. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been living here longer than anywhere else, and it's a good place. It's a good place to make music. We have a really functioning music scene. Not at the moment, unfortunately, but mm -hmm. generally lots of clubs, lots of uh, lots of people who are into electronic music. I think it's the, the biggest genre of music that people are interested in. Mm -hmm. And there's a constant influx of tourists and party people. So, uh, yeah, it's a very healthy scene. There's lots of festivals going on in the summer. So, yeah, for anyone making a bass as a producer and DJ, Amsterdam is great. We have one of the best airports in the world. So it all comes together. It's a really good package. Mm, no, absolutely. And as you say, on, in normal times, it would be, you know, the, one of the epicenters, not just in Europe, but in the world. And, you yeah. know, and for me, I feel like in recent years, Amsterdam has really almost like overtaken Berlin to an extent in terms of its vibe and in terms of you know what what it represents and maybe that's just me being biased because i spend so much time there but i am just biased but i mean berlin of course the scene there is incredible it's bigger they also have slightly better licensing laws than we do so mm -hmm. clubs can stay open for days and days mm -hmm. and it's cheaper but yeah. Amsterdam as a city is not as poor it's just uh, uh friendlier more international the women look better. <laughs> no comments. Nah, they don't. It doesn't matter. There's beautiful <laughs> women everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know what you mean. It's it's an interesting thing. And, and again, coming from the UK where, you know, unfortunately, like the licensing laws just don't stack up. And yeah. that the big thing for me is that places like Amsterdam and Berlin, they really have not just taken electronic music to their hearts they've integrated the culture into society in a way that yes. just has not happened here in the uk yeah no, um, amsterdam in particular with the amsterdam dance event the city is fully behind it they've understood that this is a very lucrative business model for the city and uh, a way of getting millions of people interested in this place hmm. so uh, i hope the uk i mean it just depends on it's a government thing, you know. If you're lucky, change a government might crack the place open for you. Yeah, yeah. We're in a very uh, precarious situation at the moment, especially where venues are concerned. Obviously, that's going to yeah. be the same case worldwide, but there's currently absolutely no support being offered to the 
live music sector and yeah, to the creative yeah. industries in general in the UK, which is a deeply troubling situation. Yeah, it's true. But I think as a producer or a DJ, today you have to think globally. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really matter where you live. It doesn't matter where you create. Um, the world's becoming a smaller and smaller place. And I sh instead of even, my, and, and as something, and then a piece of advice I would give to local DJs in particular, don't get bogged down in the infighting with other local DJs. Uh, think bigger. Find your niche somewhere on, uh, else on the planet. You know, there is, uh, uh, um, there's a world out there waiting to be uh, conquered. No, for sure, for sure. And it's interesting as well, because obviously we're talking about the effects of the virus and the lockdowns that have happened as a result of it. And as things start to kind of slowly but surely open up again, the question is inevitable of what is the dance music industry in general going to look like yeah. as things start to open up? And, and, you know, my personal take on it is I've been pretty kind of forthright about saying that, well, actually, the dance music industry as we know it kind of got killed in March and there's going to be a new version of it emerge from all of this and mm -hmm. you know depending upon various you know licensing issues and what various governments allow people to do yeah. it's going to completely change the shape of the Absolutely. electronic music landscape so it's interesting about your advice to you know newer or you know, emerging artists about not getting stuck into like the local politicking and infighting because it's a very easy thing to get yeah. distracted into. But obviously, that's great advice in the context of when this does start to open up again. It may well be driven by smaller, more localized scenes because people may not be able to travel as much. We might not be able to get together in the same kind of numbers. Yeah, yeah. There is like a logical thought process, a pattern that you can follow that would give you a reasonable understanding about what to expect. So, you know, it's, I'm interested in what your perspective would be on that from obviously from Amsterdam standpoint and also, you know, wider afield. Well, um, it's it's just very un unpredictable. So you kind of have to keep an open mind about what's going to happen. It could be a spread of things. Maybe the virus is going to be over in a few months and we're back to normal and all is well and uh, the scene returns to some sort of normalcy. Or we're going to see a few countries opting out of the corona madness. We're already seeing that. There's a few countries in Europe that... Uh, I have clubs back open like Switzerland, on the Balkan, Croatia, Serbia. They have uh, even festivals going, uh, exit festivals going to take place uh, mm -hmm. this this year. Um, so we'll, we're going to see some international travel picking up again. Um, I also think that we'll, what you just said, we're going to see a lot of small scale parties with 30 to 100 people served by local DJs or international DJs for uh, much smaller fees than uh, uh, what we're used to, um, which is not necessarily a bad thing, you know, because uh, um, it will give, once that commercial pressure of selling a lot of tickets is alleviated, you know, it gives a little bit of breathing room to be more more adventurous with the programming itself. Um, and I also think, regardless of what's going to happen, I also think that um, the the VIP culture, the bottle service culture, is definitely going to take a huge hit because a lot of that money was basically oil money from uh, from the Emirates uh, and the Middle East, and oil is just being hammered at the moment on the world market. So a lot of that money is going to dry up, and uh, I think that is musically a very healthy prospect to get back to, a, you know, a much more egalitarian uh, uh, club and festival landscape where 
nobody is going to pay 100k for a table for the night and therefore uh, increase DJ fees to a, a level that uh, it basically excludes certain DJs from playing anywhere but in Ibiza and in Vegas and a few other places in the world. So um, I think smaller clubs are going to be on the winner side. Uh, I think that uh, for, for many festival promoters it might become you know a bit more difficult because they just don't have the numbers to support their infrastructure anymore. No, it's really interesting, isn't it, to kind of just see that complete landscape shift almost overnight. And you yeah. know, I've been I've been talking to promoters in various parts of the world, and you know, as you say, the days of them paying incredibly high DJ fees for these huge international artists to come in and play, you know, maybe one or two shows over a weekend, feels yeah. like for the time being it's done, like it's over. It's impossible. I also think that. People are so desperate to party now that at least in the first phase, whatever you put up, put some speakers up, fill a room with good people will be very easy regardless of the lineup, you know, mm -hmm. because we're all dying to listen to house music again on a dance floor and move around, you know, be with our friends. Uh, yeah. Mm. No, exactly. And we're, we're having a... Uh... I'm almost terming it now like another summer of love here in the UK where it's like mm -hmm. there's a lot of illegal raves going on across oh, the cool. country, which is interesting because um, I was uh, I was watching something on the news this morning about uh, the police in London broke up uh, an illegal rave. I think it was in East London. And it was quite interesting because the way that it was shown on the news was that there was just people everywhere. And they actually had this expert on, like, you know, uh, analyzing crowds and al analyzing, like, movement patterns. And he was actually showing another piece of footage that he'd found where it actually it, it showed the more sort of truthful aspect where there was a lot of people at this party, but they were all in bubbles and they were yeah. all socially distancing within their own little groups, but they were still at the party and they were still raving. So they actually oh, wow. had almost like spontaneously and organically found ways of still being able to go out and party and be able to do it in a way where they felt safe. And there was no real mixing between the groups. There was no real yeah. movement between the little bubbles. Everybody kind of kept their, their, their distance as much as they possibly could. Obviously, it's not going to be 100% perfect, especially when you you know, bring pharmaceuticals and alcohol into the situation <laughs> as well. And yeah. Uh, yeah, it's going to be really interesting, again, from a governmental standpoint, because, you know, what we've seen here is almost akin to a, a repeat of history where, you know, the police being very heavy handed, breaking these parties up and causing more problems. So it's it's a really, really interesting dynamic because I really didn't think we'd be here again in... 30 years back you know from like the back end of the 80s so to speak but again whether it's football or dance music culture we seem to be repeating history at the moment especially mm -hmm. in the uk so yeah it's it's just a really really interesting thing so i firmly believe that artists where like the level that you're at i actually believe that what is happening it's going to really play into the hands of artists like yourself where, like you say, there's going to be these smaller venues, but you're at a level where you can kind of flex up to a bigger event if necessary, but you're also able to go and play these smaller parties. I mean, how do you, how do you see you, you yourself as an artist navigating this new normal, as they call it, or this new reality? Um, I am as clueless as anyone, you know. It's, I really just... Uh, uh, the first... Offers are starting to come in again now, so that is at least it, it picks up s slowly. But nobody has a clue what the market structure looks like at the moment. I personally just want to play, you know. I if it sounds good, if it's for friends, uh, or, or it's, it's a small private party, I have nothing to do. I'll play for free, and uh, uh, and, and personally, 
I do this because I love it. Uh, and uh, yes, I want the bills to be paid, but uh, I would do it anyway. Mm. You know, so it's, it, the, the money and also the size of the parties doesn't really change my, my approach at all. Um, I just uh, uh, want to be there for the people. And I think during the lockdown, I've, I've done a lot of thinking. And uh, I think the role that we as artists have to play right now has become so much more important mm. because uh, there's so much noise out there. There's so much people, so many people fighting with each other that uh, I think there's a huge need for people building bridges, uh, bringing us back together and creating, you know, peace and harmony and being a messenger of uh, of something that contradicts the madness and the fear of the media and is um, and, and something that sends out a unifying message to mm. the people mm. and, and 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 yeah music is just such a strong tool to 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 make that happen and uh yeah so i, f I feel really a renewed sense of purpose to not just go out there like um like uh um like a soldier fighting for a paycheck, you know, but to go out there with a the purpose of, uh, you know, opening up people's hearts again and bringing people together. So, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And you, and you raise so many good points there where, you know, our own experience here at NYT was when the lockdown started happening, we were obviously worried about what that meant for the business in general. Mm -hmm. But we very quickly realized that what we had in terms of the community that we'd already built we had the potential to be able to do exactly what you're talking about, which is attract new people, bring them into the community yeah. and give people the feeling of like they're not alone through all of this. Yeah. Uh, provide that sense of community and belonging and be able to, again, give people that sense of belonging to something bigger than just themselves. Yeah, and that's absolutely. been one of the most beautiful and really, like, humbling aspects of the last few months that, you know, we've obviously, you know, the family and the, the, the AAA, you know, family, if you will, have yeah. grown in number quite substantially. And, you know, it's been our own little way of being able to do that while we're out of venues. Yeah, yeah, and, and yeah, we are uh, also at this time in isolation uh, just underscores the need for human interaction. You know, mm. we we need we need a tribe. We need we need a family. We need to be together as people. I think this is probably the most fundamental need that we have as human beings is to be together. That's why I also I'm absolutely unwilling to accept the term new reality because it cannot be a lasting reality to be separated yeah. you, you cannot be social distancing and still be a human being at the mm -hmm. same time you know you, you so uh i i want to also kind of defy this because the only normal and the only is to follow our nature and our nature is to be together mm -hmm. and uh, uh I think we need to collectively fight for that possibility. Absolutely. And then musically as well, on top of that, to be able to realign yeah. electronic music as a culture around that purpose. Yeah. Which yeah. I feel, without opening a whole can of worms, I feel like we've maybe in recent years maybe lost sight of that somewhat. I th yeah. You've, you've heard, uh, I mean, a growing amount of what I would call business class dance music. It's a really you know? good way of putting it. <laughs> Slick productions with the purpose of, you know, selling a lot of units. Mm -hmm. and uh, uh, But, with you know, basically safe formulas rolled out over and over and over again. And uh, a lot of emphasis being put on the marketing aspect of uh, the musician career building, putting a lot of money into PR and that sort of stuff. And I think now is really the time to start making amazing, heartwarming, um, 
music again. Like the, the stuff that makes you want to cry is so good, mm. you know. And uh, and I I really hope that this yearning for um, regaining freedom and that, that 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 looking forward to that moment of coming back together to be on a festival at a festival with uh, a, a few thousand people and just having that that unifying energy that it also inspires producers now to go out on the limp a little bit to to just to really make their best music and not just try to be another um, afterlife dynamic etc uh, version because um, mm. we already have that we don't need more of that yeah exactly yeah I think it was really interesting actually it was one of your now infamous Instagram posts with uh, you were talking about you know, nobody wants me too artists I remember sharing that within the community here a few months ago, and that that was a, a a really in a good way. It was a gut punch to everyone, and it was a real kind of like reality check of like, oh, I need to kind of make sure. And we've all done it. Yeah. That area you've got to check into those little areas of yourself that want that kind of validation, right? Yeah, yeah. And that's well, a real problem. Yeah, and I, well, I think also from a, from an artist's perspective, by choosing to become like someone else, to become a Me Too artist, which is uh, financially probably a sensible move. So if you just want to make a living and you want to play it safe, um, you get good at copying something that is already proven proven to be successful. Mm. Um, but... Um, the German, uh, the German producer Stefan Goldman. I don't know whether you've heard of him before. Uh, he wrote a. He's a. He's a smart guy. He wrote a really interesting article once about um, um, how how the scene works. And what he discovered is that if you are an initiator of a genre, if you are seen as one of the top ten people within the genre, as one of the innovators, like Ricardo Villalobos would be in um, uh, in minimal techno, or uh, Adam Bayer would be in his style of uh, drum code techno, or uh, James Holden would be an innovator in this whole border community style uh, 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 electronic dance music. Once you're seen as an innovator in a scene, uh, um, and that scene keeps existing because it, it attracts other people and becomes popular you don't even have to keep producing music to stay relevant mm. you will always be seen as the number one and, uh, and and you rise with the tide that you actually initiated so i think there's much to be said for the strategy of if you're capable of creating a subgenre for yourself that's a very good way of uh of making a living and not being beholden to changing trends and uh, 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 you know and finding yourself uh, ir uh, irrelevant from one day to the other because all of a sudden nobody wants to listen to uh, say afterlife techno anymore and people want something else you know mm -hmm. you don't know mm -hmm. so if you create something that is really unique uh, a niche and you create some momentum around that niche that is probably one of the most surefire ways of making a living and at the same time be completely authentic no totally yeah but and I've, I've always kind of used various artists as like a, a really good example of that like i always go to people like hanan for example because he's yeah. just just stuck to his guns yeah and that guy's yeah. been in and out of fashion more times than any of us can remember and yeah. right now he's probably bigger than he's ever been but he hasn't changed the sound he hasn't yeah. jumped on the various bandwagons of oh shit i best become a drum code techno guy because yeah. i'm gonna get left behind otherwise you know he's always stuck to the sound that he's always authentically loved and he's always championed right from the beginning i mean with with hanan there's probably also another element to it that He's just an incredibly magnetic human being, um, very, very kind, very generous, mm. you know. So it's kind of like 
the, the Jesus of Prague. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and, and there's a lesson in there for, for other artists as well, you know. Just yeah. If you're a, a genuinely warm and kind and generous person, then uh, uh, life will be so much easier. No, absolutely. Yeah, 100%. And, and I think that, that the philosophies that you're talking about are often very simple. And I think intuitively, I think we all know them on some kind of level. But it's so easy to, as you say, get distracted or to, you know, get stuck in like the, you know, the Chinese finger puzzle of like, yeah, like you yeah, say, yeah, you know, yeah. politicking and, you know, bitching with people and stuff. Do you know what I mean? It's it's, yeah. it's so easy to, to take your eye off the ball that way. Uh, so how do you how do you kind of keep your eyes on the prize? so to speak, because I'm really interested in your trajectory, especially in the last few years, because, you know, you were always somebody who was, like, bubbling and was, like, kind of, you know, you you were what I would call, like, an artist artist. Like, yeah, if you were yeah. an artist, you knew about Patrice and you you respected Patrice and you knew exactly what, what you were all about. But then from, like, what was it, 20, sort of 15, 2016 onwards, it just took this upward trajectory. And then, you know, we are where we are today. So, you know, I'm really interested in, like, in the context of what you're saying about subgenres and all of this stuff. I mean, is that consistent with what you feel your trajectory has been? And, and what's been the driver in this, like, really amazing ascent to the position that you currently find yourself in? Well, I think it started a few years earlier. Um, I was kind of stuck in between. I, I had a, a little bit of success around 2008. I was, you know, signed with Get Physical and uh, Trapez and uh, a couple of these uh, labels. And then things fizzled out. And I uh, and not much happened to me. And I was just a local DJ trying to get by. And uh, uh, I had to, at that moment, really do some soul searching. I had a really good hard look at myself because my attitude at the time was one of, why not me? Why, why is everyone around me successful, but why am I not successful? You know. So and I was kind of play, playing the blame game. Yeah, it's because they don't like me. It's because it's always someone else, someone else who decides that you're that 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 you're not uh, not worthy, even though. But my mixes are so much cleaner and blah, blah, blah. And what I didn't um, realize that I was uh, not taking responsibility for where I was in my life. And once I understood that, that I had to own up, that I was like, if I want to play in a, in, a, in, a, in a higher league, I simply have to become a better artist and a better human being. And I have to learn how to do this. And at the time, I went through uh, a couple of like self-help books uh, to teach myself a certain amount of work ethic and discipline. Um, so I went from getting up at 11 in the morning to getting up at 6 in the morning and working out a little bit. Um, um, having a to-do list every day, having short-term goals, having long-term goals, having methods of learning. And my way of learning was looking at people who were more successful than I was, people who were already at the place where I wanted to be, mm -hmm. and then trying to decipher what made them good and take that on board. So one of my uh, inspirations was uh, you was born who now happens to be basically my neighbor. He lives around the corner. Uh, so a very nice guy. And uh, uh, I, I chose him as an uh, example because he managed to be consistently relevant and good over a long period of time. And with him, I never had the feeling that it was just based on hype or luck, but that, that there was work behind it. And I could see he has a work ethic he uh, uh, he is very consistent in what he puts out. So um, he knows exactly that 
if he wants to play in front of a bigger crowd, he has to deliver the music that is able to move a bigger crowd. So uh, I adopted some sort of uh, that, that, that kind of also a functional mindset. Mm -hmm. So I was looking at myself at my skill set and I was like, what can I do? What am I good at? What could I carve out as a niche? And then I just decided my niche would be to make bangers, to make <laughs> basically, basically make records that get the hands in the air. Mm -hmm. Because when all is said and done, people fall in love with deeper records. But at the end of the day, every DJ out there loves a few bangers in a set and there's always a shortage of good tracks that really raise the roof that mm -hmm. get you know that get that create that unifying energy where everybody's arms go in the air and you really feel at one mm -hmm. so i wanted to to make these records that uh people would be talking about the day after mm -hmm. you know because it was just a, a big moment and uh, uh and that decision gave my productions just a renewed sense of direction and uh, uh, suddenly my music was also much more functional much more usable mm. so um, uh, I didn't I didn't just see music as an art I saw it first of all as a tool it has to it has to have a, a, a a utilitarian purpose you know it has to be usable for DJs it has to do something that uh, they want to achieve on the dance floor. And yes, every DJ wants to get the crowd going heavily. So there is a market for that. And once I decided to, 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 to gear my productions to that market, it went straight up. Like immediately I got my first record got signed with, uh, with, with compact. So I was in, inside the compact fold, which has always been a dream of mine. And all of a sudden it was a reality. And then once you have, uh, one or two good records at a good label, you're on the you're on the map, and other doors open. Doors open for better remixes. It's suddenly it's very easy to to uh, send a demo to other labels and have them interested and have them come back to you. You know, mm. that it's because that, that that is a question that people often ask me: uh, How do I get my demo heard? Um, yeah, it's it, it 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 is a process. Um, it's it's. You uh, uh, you get the foot in the door somewhere, and then it's you push that wedge through that door, and the door widens, and then you have a foot in the door, and then you push your shoulder through, and then eventually you step through the door, and it becomes easy. Like uh, my 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 favorite self help guru, his name is Brian Tracy. Okay. Who's like who's like uh, who's like a very you know, down to earth, conservative, old American guy, but just really no frills, really good. And he says, everything is hard before it is easy. Mm. And, and, and you just have to have the eye on the prize continuously. It is uh, getting a demo out is, 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 is hard in the beginning and it requires a certain amount of cheekiness. And often 99 out of 100 times, the demo said, I end up getting are also not at the level that they're interesting yet, you know? Mm. So, so, uh, people have to allow themselves the time to go through that, uh, um, organic process of getting better. Yeah. And that is that getting, getting better is just putting in the hours in the studio mm. and, and, but, but at the same time, have a goal that you work towards. Mm. If you just noodle around and you, uh, I see a lot of talented artists who don't have the focus. So they'll make a down tempo album, then they make a G Pass track, and then they are, now I'm going to go produce something for a band. And yeah, they spread that talent very thin. I am a firm believer into focus and burrowing deep and find a niche and try to become world class in that niche. Mm -hmm. And then there's, there's, there will always be work for you. But uh, Nowadays, where the market of in the music market truly is a global market, you simply cannot afford to deliver local talent quality. You need world class quality. Mm -hmm. So find a niche, get really good at it. And then uh, the demo situation will take care of itself because simply 
you play at a small gig, you play your own record, the main act who plays after you is like, wow, what the fuck is this? Then you're in. Mm -hmm. You give him a demo, uh, he'll help you show that record to his friends. You know, you always one or two steps away from uh, from having the demo in the hands of uh, someone like Solomon or, or Dixon. Mm -hmm. You know someone who knows that guy. Mm -hmm. So uh, um, quality sells itself very, very easily. Mm -hmm. But you, you, it, it's just a matter of being honest, you know. Play a record out. If you don't see that reaction on the dance floor that you want, it's simply it's back to the drawing board. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I maintain that uh, that standard of quality for myself as well. I play something out, and uh, the directions are like, mm, yeah, it's kind of okay. That go that record is going back into the studio, and I'll I'll, e I'll either dump it completely when I see simply the, the dynamics, something is just not right, from when, or when I see, yeah, this is still salvageable. It's just uh, it's just uh, a. M I just need to turn a couple of knobs a little louder and uh, uh, make this thing shorter or longer or whatever. Mm. Uh, but yeah, I, I go back to the studio, fix the problem until the record is really great, you know, and then then is the time to send something out. Mm. Yeah, there's so much to unpack from that. And I think the, the thing that really stands out for me more than anything is just your clarity of vision. Yeah, the turning point for yourself was when you you know i, I mean I, I laughed at that point when you said i'm just gonna make bangers yeah but everything else gets passed through the the lens of that goal or you know that the, the lens of of that particular vision that you have for what it is that you're trying to achieve and okay. yeah you know, i think you're totally right that you know we don't maybe restrict our vision to exactly what's going to get you to where you want to be but also you know we tend to spread ourselves a little bit too thinly and then we don't hold ourselves to account i think this is really important and uh, there is this much cited 80 20 rule 20 percent of your activities contribute to 80 percent of your results mm -hmm. and in my case it's even more and i was like i was I could be, I could be running a label. I could be having my own night somewhere, and I am. Um, I could also be working as a ghost producer for other people. But when I do that, the one thing that really contributes the majority of my success, which is creating bangers, would suffer. But if I only do, if I only produce one banger after another, and I do nothing else, not even social media or any of that bullshit just big tracks and then make sure i don't uh, I, I don't fuck up my dj sets in the weekends <laughs> that's all that is required mm. you know as long as i do this one thing well and, and for me that's really uh uh that's that, that's really uh, uh a refreshing way of looking at my life to say no to a lot of temptations to say no to a lot of distraction disguised as opportunities you know it's like hey do you want to work with a classical artist no i don't want to work with a classical artist i want to i want to do my thing and i want to do that thing well mm -hmm. and i want to do it for a couple of years until i'm at the point where i'm either super sick of it or when i'm thinking hey there's nothing left to achieve now i'm ready for a new challenge you know mm -hmm. so uh yeah, uh, and, and, and the pleasant thing about this is when you have focus, your life is so simple that you don't need a lot of time to, to, do, your, to do your job, you know. I, I can, uh, my, 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 my studio day is very simple. Mm. I get up in the morning around 6 and I work 4 hours. That's it. I'm done by 10. And then... Maybe if there's a heavy deadline, um, or uh, maybe if I feel inspired, I'll get in for another hour or two in the evening, like at six or seven. I have my studio at home, so it's it's very easy to uh, to, um, to 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 do that. But um, I really restrict my hours. Mm. Um, I never work at night. 
because working at night for me means that creatively the next day is ruined. So then I would work six hours and it would cost me more than that. Mm -hmm. So I'm actually unworking, you know. That's true, yeah. So, so yeah, um, I, I think that's a, maybe a good piece of advice for anyone that to uh, to look at your biorhythm, to know your creative hours, mm -hmm. and also plan your day around those, protect those hours, you know. I don't take meetings in the morning ever. Mm -hmm. I, I, meetings, if at all, which I'm, I, mostly I try to avoid them, but if I do a meeting, I do it in those few hours where I'm never creative. Mm -hmm somewhere between two in the afternoon and five or six in the afternoon. And that's, in, you know, that's it. Mm. So, yeah, I protect my, my, my fruitful hours, really. You have to. You have to completely ring fence them. And that's actually something that when I worked with Junkie XL, uh, Tom Holkenborg, that's something he taught me, which was he calls them the golden hours. Yeah. And when was that for him? What time? Uh, believe it or not, four in the morning. Yeah. So he would go to bed at like eight. He'd actually get up at 3.30, would work from 4 a.m. until he had to take his boy to school. Yeah. And then he'd come back, maybe do a couple of hours, maybe like 9 till like 11 a.m. Yeah. And he's done for the day. And then the rest yeah. of his day is steering the absolutely ridiculously huge team of assistants that he's got working for him and taking meetings. And going through what he's already worked on with studio heads and, you know, film directors and stuff. And then going back to the drawing board and then he's got the rest of his day free to spend with his family. Yeah. He, you know, has a relatively normal life. And he just has found out that there is most creative hours. So what he's actually done is that he's designed his entire life around those hours because those hours are how he pays the bills exactly so like you would if you were in a regular job you would ring fence the hours of nine to five <laughs> day to friday if you will because guess what you've got no other choice you've got to do it yeah you've yeah. got to treat it that way you know and that's very similar to a book that we've referenced a lot here at NYT, which is The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield. Mm -hmm. And he calls exactly what we're talking about right now, turning pro. And you turn up every single day, yeah. regardless of whether or not you're inspired or not. And you sit in the damn chair and you write. Yeah. And if inspiration, or as he calls it, the muse doesn't tap you on the shoulder that day that's well, okay exactly she'll come and tap me on the shoulder tomorrow but she can't tap me on the shoulder if i'm not sat in the chair exactly yeah and also sometimes you have to get the bullshit out of the pipeline first to get to the good stuff yeah so you have to and if you don't work at all the bullshit stays stuck in the pipeline yeah so i'm thinking if i if i'm hitting a, a dry patch I just keep on noodling in the studio anyway, and I'm 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 not putting any pressure on myself. Uh, I'm just you know, I know it's going to be garbage. I don't expect anything else. And 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 then maybe after a week or two or three, all of a sudden I work myself back into the zone. Mm. And uh, uh, that wouldn't have happened had I not done anything until I felt creative again. You know, mm. for me. If, I, if, I, if I'm not working, I don't feel creative. Mm. You know, when I'm when, when I'm in a, when I'm in a bad phase, I need to work myself out of that bad phase. Yeah, absolutely. You need to kind of flush the system. It's kind of like a block yeah, drain, exactly. isn't it? It's like you've got to flush exactly. it out and and get that out the other side. And I always quote Giorgio Moroder on that as well. That he talks about, and he said this once on a Radio Six interview in the UK. He said. Uh, for every 10 songs you write, you'll write one good one. Yeah. But you needed to write the nine bad ones in order to get to the one good one. Absolutely. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> I admire those men who, um, you know, they hit on 10 girls knowing 
they'll get a yes from one of them. <laughs> it's but a numbers game, mate. It's a numbers exactly, game. they play the numbers game when they're not worried about rejection. And I think that's yeah, that's just a smart move. And it's the same with music, you know. Mm. Mm. No, absolutely. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I think yeah. too many people are worried about rejection. Yeah. No, it's it's process over outcome with anything. Uh, the pr you don't have that much control over your outcome, but mm. you have 100% control over the process. Mm. And good process will yield good outcome eventually. And, and at some point, your process is so fine-tuned that good outcome becomes predictable. Mm. It almost becomes so, automatic as a yeah. result of, you know, one of the things we work on here. Uh, we, we, we literally do process over outcome. We do systems rather than goals. Exactly. And it's about designing a system that actually makes the goals happen on almost an autopilot kind of basis, but you have to apply and make sure the system is executed. Yeah, exactly. And, and the goal is actually to make sure that your bad days are still pretty good. Mm. No, you know, absolutely. That you yeah, you you know you're never you're never gonna produce a life changing hit every every day, mm -hmm. not even every year. You know those come those come by rarely. Uh, mm -hmm. But when your worst tracks that you that you deem release worthy are still above the uh, above the fray, head and shoulders above anyone else's or most people's, then uh, you'll have a you'll, you'll be able to make a living, and and, and that's. Uh, uh, yeah, that should be the goal. Mm. Uh, uh, that's that's something also I realized that being good at what you do is by far the most predictable way to make a living in this business. Mm. Because uh, a, a lot of artists are uh, uh, basing a career around uh, 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 personality or marketing uh, or, or you know charisma and. and it's all good and well, but that is something that at some point the good looks are gone, you know, mm. and you're uh, and you're, you're you're no longer the the the, the heartthrob of the town. And uh, <laughs> uh, at that point, you want to make sure that you still have the skills that make it desirable, mm. you know. And so I've always admired the kind of artists that where I knew they've worked their asses off in the studio. Someone like Maceo Plex. Eric mm. Eric is a, is, is a maniac, uh, and he's always been uh, everything he's achieved. He's he's done it on his merits, and I could I could see it in his catalog, from the earlier stuff to his Matrix phase to uh, Marcel Plex. There was just a constant line of improvement mm. improvement in there, and I think to have a, a trajectory that spans over many years, but it's just slowly going up and up mm. and up, is so much better than locking into a quick hit and then uh, and then nothing else comes you know you, you want to be a Marcel Plex you don't want to be a, let's say a Julio Bashmore Absolutely. where you have one massive summer and then after that how do you reproduce it if, you know mm. yeah so, exactly uh, when you've only got so many tools in the box and you've kind well, of you have, used them all yeah if you have if you have no musical tools in the box, it's so much more difficult than if no, you have totally. a foundation that's rock solid. And honestly, you know, having spent time with Massio, with Eric, and just picking his brains, he's just so unbelievably authentic. And that really stands out when you speak to him, that he's just so in this for the right reasons. And I love the way that he explains what we were talking about earlier, about, you know the difference between a, a true artist who just writes what's in their hearts and what he calls artisans. Yeah, a and craftsman. Like a craftsman, where it's like, you know, I can make you a drum code banger, go yeah. to order, come back tomorrow, and here's your drum code banger. And, you know, both are, both are, are very relevant and both are very yeah. valid. Yeah, absolutely. Far too many of us fall into being artisans when we actually mean to be artists. Yeah. And it was just such a beautiful... He said this quite a few years ago, actually, in a Residence Advisor Exchange interview, which I would highly recommend people to listen to. Mm -hmm. And and he came out with this, and it completely shifted my, my landscape at that point. And I think, actually, I was working with Sasha at the time. 
and it kind of made me reflect on my own artisanal nature and made me think, oh, actually, there's going to be a time where I'm, you know, pardon the pun, I'm going to make my transition yeah. into being an artist of, you know, of my own standing, essentially. And it really helped me understand what I was doing. But too many people think they're being an artist and they're not. They're being a craftsman. Yeah, yeah. It's true. Yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. And there's one point that I want to go back to as well, which is this whole point of like, you know, rejection as well. Because uh, one of our members here, Paul Harrison, makes a makes an interesting comment saying it's about having a thick skin. Now, I'm actually going to disagree with him on that. And the reason why I disagree with him is because my sort of whole thought process and understanding about rejection is very different to a lot of people. I actually believe rejection doesn't exist. I believe rejection is actually what I would call redirection. Where, say for example, you send something to a record label, you get quote unquote rejected, and yet you could have a thick skin about it and be like, you know, really like kind of belligerent and very kind of bloody minded about it, and that's okay. But what's actually happening is that you're being redirected towards where you are actually meant to be. Yeah, yeah. And I that mean, is a it's a learning process. It's like what uh, John Kavanagh, Conor McGregor's coach, he always says: you either win or you yeah, learn, right? Exactly. Yeah, but you, it's best if you turn a rejection into a learning experience. So, which is difficult if you don't hear back at all from someone you sent a demo. You know, right. the rejection might simply consist of the fact that the guy has a thousand emails in his inbox and has just just said to himself, you know what? It's Friday afternoon. Fuck it. I pushed the delete button. Bye bye. You know, and it's all gone. Um, I have, uh, I remember back in the days um, when I made my first records, there's a few ARs out there who take the time to actually give you feedback, even though if the record of the demo isn't good. But if just a few lines of feedback is extremely valuable. Huge. And and and, 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 and and even, I mean, if you have a mate that is honest and who knows his shit around music, uh, that he could give you extremely valuable feedback. So uh, I was always looking for feedback and I could take away so much from, from feedback. Um, a five minute conversation with someone else can open up your eyes about your music forever. Mm. Remember, um, I once I once talked to it was a classical uh, musician, a classical composer. I've always wanted to ask you about this. Uh, I've um, heard about this. And uh, um, I showed him one of my tracks, and he's like, "You know, it's all good and well, but it stays so flat." And I was like, "Yeah, but it's meant to be like that. It's uh, I want to make kind of like a minimal, monotonous sound. I want it to be hypnotic." And he's like. And uh, no, it's not the same. It's, uh, you 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 need a story. You need an arc. You know, it needs to go somewhere. It's like it's like telling a story without a point, or a movie that without suspense. All of those don't work, and it's the same with the track. It doesn't matter how minimal or how big it is. Mm. There needs to be a story, and it needs to work towards a climax, and then you have a conclusion, and you finish it off. And, and and that has stuck with me from that day on. And mm. this is something now I pay extreme attention to is that my track has a structure where it never repeats itself and it never falls still. Mm. So at, 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 at no point do I want to be stuck, you know? So, um, yeah, this is... Uh, this is something I pay an extreme attention to with my 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 um, arrangements. Mm, no, absolutely. I mean, for me, it's it's understanding. I've even gone as far as almost mapping like the Joseph Campbell hero's journey concept uh, arrangement, where you know, at the, at the beginning of the track, you answer the call to adventure, mm. and you go through various 
moments yeah. of uncertainty and challenge and then you get to the cathartic payoff yeah. in the final act. And that's kind of like within the DNA of how I arrange tracks. And I think it's it's really, really important for people to kind of think in those types of terms. Absolutely. You know, and they're classical storytelling tropes for a reason, right? Because they work and they, they talk about the human condition more than anything. And like you say, like the more sort of like, you know, melodic, more emotional styles of music are very, very well constructed and, and very well set up for that kind of storytelling. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and honestly, sometimes you see uh, that um, the conventions within a genre have kind of deviated away from uh, uh, from functionality. So, uh, for instance, I... Uh, uh, I have that that problem with a lot of tech house, deep house, and prog records, where they're littered with unnecessarily long breaks. Basically, you're making a dance record, and you tell people not to dance between minute two and four, five and seven, mm -hmm. and eight and nine. And it's like, uh, um, I find it as a DJ, I find it so important that... Um, Regardless of any creativity, the record has to be functionally sound and the energy has to transfer from start to finish. And uh, if you're making people stop, people don't come to, uh, to, 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 to a club or to a party to not dance. They come there to dance. If you make them stop, you better have a good reason. Mm. And I see that very often it's like, oh, I just need to change more. Let's take the beat out. And let's take the beat back in. Um, there's the, the the break, and that and that moment has no functional meaning. Mm. Uh, so one of the uh, basic principles from, from 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 my productions is everything needs to have a purpose. Everything needs to have a, a meaning and need to serve a greater purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, if it doesn't have to be in there, it must not be in there. Mm -hmm. In other words, as much as necessary, as little as possible. Mm -hmm. No, totally, totally. And I'm smiling at all of this because these are conversations that we've had privately before and it, they've been fairly transformative for me, if I'm being completely honest, because you know, you, you know kind of what my background is and what my capabilities are. And I sometimes shall we say, struggle to keep uh, all the tools in the box, you know? Because yeah. Because when you're so <laughs> capable of so much, like disciplining yeah. yourself to kind of go, no, no, you don't need to put the bell and whistle in there. I know you can make it fit. And I always remember shortly before I was signed to Bedrock, I sent you the tracks and you were like, why are there so many fucking breakdowns in these records? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. it caused me to kind of like go back to them and go, yeah, actually, there's there's maybe a little bit of a noodling going on here, uh, you know, an, an unnecessary sort of uh, you know uh, arrangement masturbation, if you will. Yeah, so I mean, it's like take those bits out, and the whole thing became really lean off the back of it. I mean, I think uh, I'm what I'm not trying to sell my type of production as the only valid way of producing that's uh, that's bullshit it, it, this this my artistic decisions they apply to me mm. i just want to encourage uh you guys out there to have a reason for whatever you're doing that everything has to happen for a reason that you you know that is that is functional so for instance uh, a lot of people litter that tracks with little bits and bobs um to to you know to add excitement and to you know give a bit of ear candy and that is that is good but the moment you have a little pop fall right with the introduction of a new element then it's not just decoration but it becomes functional Mm. And uh, uh, you know, so that every little bit and bob is something that is transformational. Uh, that is uh, uh, that that 
that opens a new a new door and it's not just it comes and goes and then the track is back to normal but it's like oh now the story evolves to the next level mm. so I, I i i love doing that with uh with the facts that you know and sometimes it happens randomly so i'm just playing around with um with a reverb or a delay and it's uh, beautiful please but where the delay goes a little crazy and i'm like you know what instead of introducing that high at two bars before I introduce it at the end of that uh, at that uh, random little effect that uh, that's been created there, and then all of a sudden the track cr gets a bit more character. It sounds a bit more organic. It sounds a little bit off, but right at the same time because yeah. uh, you know it uh, it's it's tight. Yeah, yeah, it's really interesting, and 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 again, you know, from knowing your process to an extent it's like the amount of space that you leave by being so like ruthlessly functional means that you create space for these types of experiments to take place and you're allowing the what you would call the happy accidents or the interest in experiments to have their output and to have their executions and to be able to sift through them and then be able to understand, you know, what kind of effect it's going to have on the track overall. Exactly. And also less elements. I would compare it to pizza. Let's say a track is a pizza and that pizza always has the same size. If you have four elements that drive the track and that's four large slices of pizza, if you have 60 tracks, then everybody gets a thin slither, you know. <laughs> so, the, so each each of the elements separately is just an insignificant little slither because at the end end of the day, you can only put a certain amount of uh, uh, of energy into a track. And if you have very few elements, you can make your lead extremely dominant. Mm -hmm. And that's how you that's how you win the loudness war without actually having to go that loud. It's like if there's room in your track. And uh, the, your leading element, your signal element, just pops out, and it just destroys the records that comes before it and the one that comes after it. You bet that the DJ who plays that record will play it again the next time mm -hmm. because everybody loves a dominant record. So for me, um, dominance, a dominant lead element, is the starting point of everything. Mm -hmm. So um, someone asked uh, the, the, the the question how um, what what my production process is whether I start with a with a with a bass or with a with a with with, with some percussion or something like that. I try to start with the lead element, mm. with dominant bit, because that is the centerpiece that will sell uh, that will sell the track that makes the track recognizable. If I have a lead that is interesting and powerful and dominant, I can build a completely standard run-of-the-mill track around it and the track will work and mm -hmm. will sound unique. But if I do it the other way around and I invest a lot of hours just building a track and then at the end all I need is a lead and I can't come up with it, then I've wasted many hours in the studio just to have an unfinished track. Mm. So, by putting the lead element first, the the hook, so to speak, and the hook could be many things, it's just something loud and aggressive. Uh, that's what, what what I like, or something extremely catchy and recognizable, or whatever your your thing is. But if you have that lead nailed in first, uh, then the chance of finishing the track increases tenfold. Mm. That's why I start with the lead, mm -hmm. just just because it makes it more uh, uh, makes my time more effective in the studio. No, exactly, because if that's going to be the thing that's effectively going to sell the record. Yeah, exactly, and you end up not throwing away nine out of ten tracks, but you throw away maybe one out of two tracks. Mm -hmm. Or when I when I'm in the flow, I can you know sometimes I'm in the flow, I make five or six remixes, send them off. And I get not a single request to change anything from any of the labels. They're just happy. They're like, "Oh yeah, can you make a radio edit or something?" And mm -hmm. that's all. That's all there is. So, mm -hmm. so yeah. um, it's, it's simply 
if you have confidence in your productions, you know, like if confident sounding sounds, then uh, that sells, that convinces other people too. Mm-hmm. You know? No, absolutely. That's it. And again, it's that clarity of vision on a much deeper kind of level as you were talking about before, rather than the entire concept of what it is that you're trying to achieve. It's that depth of focus on just one yeah. main element that is absolutely machine tooled yeah. very accurately to perform a specific function on the dance floor it's actually really simple first you find the element that people remember and that that, that makes the track stand out the hook um then you make sure your arrangement is done in a way that it builds towards a climax mm-hmm the climax is the moment when the when the room is being unified, when all the hands go in the air and everybody looks around them and smiles and they feel like, wow, we're in this together. Mm. That, that, those are the magic moments. And then you make sure that arrangement is functionally sound for DJ to be played, you know, that... Uh, that, it, that the energy transfers well from start to finish, that there is an intro and an outro, because I don't like playing records that uh, make it hard for me to integrate them in a, into a set. Even though sometimes creatively it's more rewarding to do something very unique, mm. I kind of start my tracks simply with a kick drum and, 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 and you know, start quite minimal and then, then build from there. It's, it's really not fancy at all mm. because I know the meat on the bone is what happens in the middle, you know. Uh, once you have that hook nailed down and once you have the, the, the climax, and, and, and the most important thing of the climax is, hang on. The most important thing of a, of a climax is that uh, uh, the dynamic range from one moment to the next is massive. Mm. So while you build up the intensity, intensity, and then from that moment when the drop falls, there needs to be a huge increase in energy. Mm. And the bigger that increase is, the more impact you have, the better that climax works, the more successful the track is. I can already tell in the studio, oh, this is a track that many people are going to play because it just it just explodes. So I'm mm. always I'm always looking for that explosion, and the the, the bigger the explosion, and people always say, yeah, but uh, it's it's not very creative to do use things like white noise, etc. Yeah, I get that. I use white noise a lot. But it's functional, you know. Mm. It 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 works, and you can still make it sound you're a little bit unique if you have a, you know, if you if you if you search for a, a few tricks and alternative solutions to make noise sound a little different they're out there Mm -hmm. um but uh the explosion and the recognizability those two elements is what sells at least my tracks Mm, no absolutely And, and the thing is like a lot of people say oh yeah white noise is quite cliche as if that's a bad thing it's like well cliches are cliche for a reason it's because they absolutely tend to be universally true exactly and and it's a language that everybody understands and i think this is extremely important um even with abstract art uh, for me always a good example is uh, uh like the cubism phase of picasso when he when he painted his his women and his guitars and they were just cubic cubic objects uh you could still immediately see that it was a guitar or a woman, even though he used a language that was unfamiliar, but at the same time familiar. So even though he used a novel process, he never lost sight of being able to communicate mm. uh, with, uh, with, uh, with, the, with the people looking at the picture. And it's the same with music. You can go crazy, but don't lose sight of uh, of making it of, of of the communication, people still need to understand what you're trying to bring across. Mm. So, I see a lot. I think good experimental music still knows to somehow um, convey a conventional message. Yeah, totally. You know, totally. that's for instance. I think that's what I keep coming back to. James Holden, 
peak James Holden in his border community days. He was so good at novel sound design, but at the same time, bringing across traditional dance floor dynamics uh, that made it easy for every DJ to play the record and mm. for every dancer to understand the record. Mm. And uh, yeah, so functionality is something you shouldn't abandon if you make dance music. No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. I couldn't agree more. And, you know, obviously, sometimes we need to kind of experiment in more esoteric ways in order for, you know, us to fulfill our own creative needs, so to speak. But it's so important to not throw the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak. Okay. You know, we have to... It's a bit like, you know, trying to send an email to someone and then going off into a poem halfway through and then coming back and saying, oh, can you just let me know about this bit? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's like, it's yeah, that kind yeah. of thing. Like, you know, not to sound yeah. reductive about it, but, you know, I've seen it in DJ sets. I've seen it in live performances. It's a bit yeah. like, uh, you've seen the movie Wayne's World, right? Yeah. It's like, you know, the, the sign at the back which says, no stairway to heaven. At the back of the music shop, like you know, because basically yeah. people are there just noodling, giving it loads of solos and stuff. Oh and, yeah, 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 yeah. You yeah, know, and, yeah. and you get lost in the whole like thing of it all, and it's like, no, there's no stairway to heaven. Like you know, keep it down, basically. Like you know, remember who you're playing to. Yeah. And it's it's totally true that you know I've seen that so many times where, unfortunately, certain acts they they kind of get lost in that, and then unfortunately they lose the audience as well as themselves. Yeah. And I think this is also a very important lesson. Um, do one thing in the track, convey one message mm. and convey it well. Don't put even two ideas in it. Don't, you know, I've, it's, the tracks that are neither fish nor fowl, that are something in the middle that are a little bit wishy-washy or that have, that are one thing and then they turn into another thing, they rarely work. Mm. Because in the DJ's mind, the DJ thinks, I need this one particular thing right now. Mm. I need power, or I need emotion, or I need happiness. What they'll never say is, I need something that is mellow, happy, and sad, and also powerful at the same time. Mm. Doesn't compute. So that's, that's why I also think simplicity is really, really important. And um, um, I avoid complexity, I avoid introducing too many elements by simply just modulating one element throughout the track. Mm. And, uh, and, and, and then just as I continue into the track, so I'm always trying to have a, have a, find a lead that works with the filter closed and then opens up in a big way as I open up the filter so yeah. that the lead alone already gives me a lot of dynamic range. Uh, and then in the peak moment, I, I, I go all out. And then I also, you know, I always have my sand effects, my ping pong delays and whatever, uh, just to, at that peak moment, I'll open up all the floodgates and then it closes again. Mm. Uh, so, uh, but I, what I try to avoid is, is to layer another element in there and another one and another one and another one. So instead of that, I just modulate a single element mm -hmm. and make that more interesting, you know, and then all I need is maybe in the, in the most important bit of the song when there is a conclusion, maybe, you know, add a pad or add a second voice that is just simply white noise played on the same notes as uh, uh, as as the lead or something, you know, mm. um, something that helps me gain even more economy within the track is if you can somehow combine uh, the lead with the bass line. So, for instance, the Bukashet guys they used to be so good, like the Mandarin Girl track, you know, yeah, um, body but, language, that kind of. Yeah, yeah, know. exactly. Yeah, yeah. A lot of those tracks, they're just the, the lead is the bass, and, and that immediately, when one element can take care of two things at the same time, it just opens up, uh, you know, it opens up room. It makes it, the, the track more economical, and, and that also means you can make your mix louder because there's less elements competing with each other. Mm. 
No, it's totally true. And, and the thing is, like, I, I've I've seen this a lot when I've given feedback to to members on their tracks, where there's almost like an entire EP's worth of musical ideas, all fighting and competing for space with one another in the context yeah. of one track, and it's almost as if like. I've said to, to various members over the, the last year, what you've actually got here, it's almost like what a composer would call a suite. Yeah. It's a, a sketchbook of ideas. It's not really a track. What you've done yeah. is that you've proven various concepts in one way or another. Actually, what you now need to do is decide which of these hooks musical ideas, concepts, whatever they are, which yeah. ones need to be removed and which ones need to be put in the bin and which ones need to be put into various other tracks. You know, and it's interesting because, again, they're always the people who are really struggling with mix downs because they're struggling to balance everything. And that pizza analogy you used before is just so <laughs> beyond perfect because it really does speak to just how much space all of these elements get in the mix. Exactly. How much expression you can give to each one of those ingredients, you know? Uh, yeah. So, and yeah, one thing I, I noticed with a lot of producers is that um, they use two elements which are basically the same kind. So they will use two or more pads. They will use two or more arpeggios. Um several leads, several different types of uh, white noises, etc. Um, just make sure you use one of a kind. And and, 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 and that has to be enough, you know. Uh, so, so I'm always trying to stick to one of a kind. And uh, um, if I want variation in my hi-hat, I'll, uh, I'll make the hi-hat with, uh, with the white noise on the synth and then I can modulate the length of the hi-hat, uh, so it just stays really short, and then it goes longer in, in, in the peak moments, you know? So every, if almost every element that I use has some kind of possibility to modulate from small mm -hmm. to large, uh, uh, and, 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 and that way I don't need more elements, because the few elements that I have already have a sufficiently enough vocabulary to express a lot of energy and a lot of emotion and a lot of versatility mm. no absolutely i've always said that i love elements that can almost like perform more than one role yeah within a track like like you're saying with the the hi-hat which is essentially white noise and then the yeah. envelopes lift and then all of a sudden it becomes a riser um i i love that on like you know 16th note shakers where you kind of get that white noise going and then that envelope can kind of almost like randomly modulate. You can even assign it to something like an LFO through the track. Yeah, 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 yeah. You, know, yeah, you get yeah. all of that lovely movement and then a little bit of side chain and on top of that, a little bit of groove, you're into a whole other territory where yeah, yeah. it just it becomes this whole other thing, right? And again, it's like it's that whole thing about dominance that you were talking about before. And, and one of our members here, Nicholas Pinto, he asks a really great question. Any tips on how to ease the process of getting that dominant lead that you've been talking about? Um, use quality basic sounds. Like the, uh, it, the, the lead sound, uh, it could be something, what I like is sounds with a lot like either something with a lot of attack mm -hmm. so for, so for instance a track um like uh my, the last uh, um I'm, I'm not sure whether you guys are familiar with any of my uh, my tracks but i made a track oh, called one, sender. Or, one or two yeah <laughs> yeah yeah i made I made a track called sender on on uh, uh, um on uh, um afterlife mm -hmm. uh the lead in that is kind of like um, a, a percussive bell-like sound that is like ding, 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 ding. You know, it's like, uh, uh, and and that has a really hard attack, 
and that followed by a really bright sound. Mm -hmm. so, 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 so when I go through, uh, let's say I go through assemble banks of sounds, there's always sounds that somehow pop out that are that are that are more aggressive than than the sounds around them, and then and these are the sounds that I'm interested in, and and often, like I never make music with some with with a with an end goal in mind i always follow the the the, the method of letting the music write itself mm. so if i go through a list of sounds or i go through a bunch of presets on my synth i don't know the result you know i'm just i'm just noodling until something pops out and you can hear it you know it's just uh, and, and certain certain instruments also deliver you more popped out sound than others so for instance my favorite synth uh, prophet 6 for instance it, it's just mm -hmm. capable of bigger lead sounds than uh, let's say uh, uh, some other uh, I have a bunch of other synths that, that the prophet 6 is just bigger or a great a great sound a sounding synth for 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 aggressive big leads is um, the, uh, the the mini moog or in my case i have the the, the Behringer model d mm. which i think is the best deal in synth land i mean you can get it for probably less than 300 euros mm -hmm. such an incredibly good sounding hardware synth uh, I, I i think for me, the Mini Moog solves bass problems, solves arpeggiator problems, and solves lead problems. And it always sounds good, and it's such a beautiful, harmonic, bread and butter sounding synth uh, that can be really, really, you know, dominant and aggressive. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, no, simply know your instruments and, and look for look for look for attack, look for like these full harmonic big sounds that follow the attack mm. bell sounds you know something yeah it's 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 really hard to put them in, into words but just look for the sounds that pop out and then play around with those mm. Mm. no it's amazing no it's fantastic i mean there's again there's just so much to unpack here and obviously we haven't even quite got we've started to answer people's questions but we haven't quite yeah, got yeah, through yeah. them in a sequential level so yeah I maybe, know. maybe we could start to do that now yes because i know what me and you are like well we'll still be here at two in the morning yeah no let's uh, get focused <laughs> yeah so yeah so what i'll do is i'm just gonna move over now uh at the moment let me just uh sort some stuff out here and we'll go into more of a screen share and yeah we can uh we can look at it here so first of all we've got joey emont's question here uh, i'd like to know how quickly patrice chooses to lay down midi to audio if at all and exactly what is workflow between the flexibility of midi versus the flexibility of audio at what point in the track does he decide to stick with one against the other? Uh, and then is there like that process of committing to audio rather than MIDI? Because the thing is, obviously, I know you use a lot of hardware. So how much of that is like in the MIDI domain? How much of it is in audio? Like what's the what's the workflow there for you, mate? My hardware, I, I, I'm not I'm not a, I'm not a trained musician so I'm not good at playing instruments so 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 very often I'm forced to at least draw the MIDI notes with the mouse first or uh, just find them on my keyboard and then you know draw them in like uh, like a, like you know like a, a beginner um, <laughs> but uh, but uh, uh, then very quickly I so when I make a track I, from the start, I already know where my arrangement goes. I immediately decide this is my intro section, this is my uh, build-up, this is where the climax goes, and or a little break, and this is where my outro goes. And then, as soon as I have a new sound, I immediately lay the notes in that uh, in that grid. Mm -hmm. And um, so, so with a hardware synth, I would immediately uh, uh, jam it, a uh, jam with it on the grid so 
follow with the uh, follow with the filters and with the with, with the envelopes and whatever. Follow already the 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 the, the natural path of the arrangement. And record that straight to audio, and 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 so I, I committed. I commit immediately. All my hardware synth gets gets immediately recorded to audio because I find it really refreshing that there is a point of no return. Mm. When I'm doubtful, before I commit, I save the preset on my synth. Uh, make sure I write the preset in in the track. Uh, 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 that I've that I've where I record uh, the, the the audio into, so I can find the original synth back, and then I start with a new version, mm-hmm. and then delete the old MIDI. So there is no there, there's a, there would be a way back by going back to a previous version, but my 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 actual track, my latest version, is nice and clean. Mm. So uh, so I will I will commit immediately, uh, and and uh, with. MIDI uh, instruments, if it's not necessary, and my computer is pretty powerful, so uh, I, I then I'm, like I use Omnisphere a lot. Uh, I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't write it to MIDI, unless I use Omnisphere at the end of a track to simply find some nice effects to 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 um, to just make you know to garnish the track a little bit, mm-hmm. to to accentuate uh, certain elements a little bit more. Then those I would I'll simply jam, record straight away, and then cut the audio, and and place it in the right in the in the, in the right place, and then very often, if I wanted uh, if I need changes, I will simply copy portions from other parts of that uh, uh, of that uh, audio bit that I've previously uh, recorded, and just copy and paste over the over the over the bad sections, or I really drill into the clip. In, in, in Ableton and then work on the on the on the envelopes or work on that um, um, I don't know how do you call this the trick that I learned from that Canadian dude that you taught him with the, where you basically shorten the bit behind the transients oh yeah yeah with the warp yeah, and you exactly. can kind of do it in beats and do the transients and like glitch yeah. things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's, an, it's an incredibly useful trick. It's kind mm-hmm. of like works similar to the SPL transient designer, mm-hmm. um, where it finds your transients and then it just cuts the envelope behind them. So, mm-hmm. for instance, if you have a loop with uh, a percussive loop with a lot of uh, reverb around it, it basically helps you to cut out the reverb and turns it into something really dry. Mm. Ah, interesting. Interesting. On that front, um, we had a, a really great young Dutch producer on recently called Holt. And he's actually developed, because you know that that whole warp section is one of the very few parts of Ableton that you can't automate? Yeah. He's actually found a way of automating it through a Max for Live oh, plugin wow. that he's built. Oh, great. So I'll uh, I'll send that over to you because you'll love it. Oh, that. nice. Yeah. And you just put it on the track and then uh, it, it opens up? Yeah, so what it is is that it actually allows you to do the same kind of thing through the simpler, you know, because the warp engine is in simpler. So it allows you to then essentially map those controls and you can effectively map it to a MIDI controller and go crazy and do, like, you know, lengthening the envelope, shortening the envelope at different times. You can assign it to, like, LFOs and stuff. It yeah, just nice. opens out the world of creativity that you would want for that kind of option, yeah, as well yeah. as everything that you're talking about, which is way more functional and very, you know, process driven that allows you to get to a certain place. Yeah. But to get back to the committing, I mm. think committing to audio as soon as possible is actually really helpful to, uh, to uh, move your production process forward because you have to make decisions and uh and that way when there's no way back you learn to make decisions quickly mm. you know, because uh, uh many people have the problem of uh, paralysis through analysis and they just keep you right, know that's me. Getting, lost in, <laughs> getting getting lost in details uh i think it, always a good reality check is just listen to a track on a club system mm. and see how much of these details still play a role and it's actually, they don't really play much of a role. They are more ear candy for the headphones. Mm-hmm. But once you're in a club, 
you uh, the, the the overall image becomes much coarser. Mm. No, absolutely, absolutely. So moving on to uh, other questions here. Uh, Brad here, do you prepare yourself before going into the studio? Do you set specific intentions or do you go with the flow? How do you channel your inspiration? And what is your most peak highest experience with music? There's quite a lot to unpack there. Um, for me, the single best preparation for going into the studio is a good night's of sleep. Mm. So if I start my studio day at six in the morning or sometimes also a little later, sometimes a little earlier, sometimes, you know, you just wake up at five uh, naturally and, and you feel like oh, I'm going to the studio and those are always good hours. Um, I need to be asleep by 11 to really have a good studio day the next day. Mm. Nothing else matters. That really matters. If I go to bed at 10 or 11, the next day in the studio is probably going to be pretty good. Um, if I'm going to bed after 2 in the morning, or then I know my next studio day, will, I might as well not turn up. So, so that alone is my preparation. That's why I also think pulling all-nighters, where you fuck up your own sleep rhythm, when you stay awake with uh, um, by, by drinking a lot of coffee, um, it's uh, it's counterproductive. Mm -hmm. um, so let's go back to the next question that he asked. Uh, yeah, uh, how do you channel your inspiration? Um, I just stop thinking. <laughs> you know? uh, so, so 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 basically, um, I don't force it. I don't think what, about my next step. But I try to ha approach the, the music with an empty, uh, the, or the whole process with an empty brain, mm -hmm. like an innocent child playing with buttons. And uh, I try to see myself, and I think I'm a, f I'm a firm believer that we actually are just mediums, that the music is out there, and our brains are simply antennas catching the moment somehow, mm -hmm. you know? But that the actual magic doesn't happen by us, but through us. And, and 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 that's how I see inspiration is just to to be an open, empty vessel and just letting it go through me. The Native Americans had a uh, a term for that. They when say for example their spiritual leaders could you know talk about various different aspects of the world beyond, if you will. They they called it being a hollow bone. Oh, cool. Which is that thing of like being empty enough to allow yeah. these things to come in. Yeah. And like you say, to be a channel for it and to allow you to, you know, essentially tap into these ideas and then, yeah. as you say, allow it to move through you, you know? that That's such yeah. a, a, a profound thing. It really is. Perfect. It's just like Bruce Lee, be like water, mm -hmm. you know? Take whatever shape uh, uh, your surroundings dictate, and uh, yeah, have that flexibility. I think, and, and I used to do that, and I think many as up and coming producers, starting producers, do that. They come with an idea, they they they, they wake up, they've had a dream of a certain track, of a certain melody, yeah, and then they try to find it, that that sound in the machines, and for me. First of all, my brain thinks exactly like any other people, any other person's brain. So anything that I think of sounds conventional. Sure. The moment, the moment I introduce a certain element of randomness that I don't have control over, um, then I'm reaching a territory that uh, uh, that is uh, terra incognita for you know, uh, and that sounds novel and and. and I surprise myself in that moment, and then all I have to do is catch that and then curate this and shape it into a mold that becomes a, a usable track. So um, yeah, this is this is definitely is, is one of my most important tricks to, you know, introduce accidents, introduce randomness, and and, and simply catch the best bits and mm. put them into a track rather than coming with a firm idea into the studio and then trying to will that music out of my uh, out of my machines mm. Mm. No, absolutely because th that can be really like 
confusing compared to what we said before. It's important to have clarity of vision. But what you're talking about in terms of, you know, trying to will this thing into existence, yeah. that's kind of like overstepping out of that sweet spot into a much more kind of like restrictive and therefore it's, rigid and, and very like uninspiring way of working. It, exactly. It's like uh, um, I, I, I surf a little bit. Um, I'm, I'm a horrible surfer, um, so disclaimer. But <laughs> uh, uh, one time uh, a guy gave me a really good piece of advice is don't chase the waves. Mm -hmm. Let the waves come to you. And this is a metaphor for life. Don't go force things. Don't try to, uh, you know, uh, will things your way. But uh, simply be open, be receptive, and let and then just take advantage of the opportunities that come your way. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that means being a little patient, you know. And uh, sometimes you you don't catch a wave for two days, and you don't you don't you don't catch a good idea in the studio for two days. But then on the third day, something happens that has never happened to you before and that you turn into a track and you send that track out there and the track sounds like nothing else other people are doing. Mm. Because, and, and that is exactly what the mindset of trying to be like someone else doesn't allow because then you're listening to, oh, fuck, that synth line has to be, you know, a little bit, um, uh, has a little bit of glide on it. So it sounds like, uh, so it sounds like an after afterlife track. And how did I do it with the melodies? I've been there. I've tried that as well. Um, the results that I've gotten from that, they were never, uh, never as good as uh, the original. Mm. No, absolutely. Yeah, it, it, you're so right. You're so so correct on that, dude, for sure. Any, anyway, to come back to that last question, the the the, the most intense musical experience or, or, uh, or your peak musical experience? Peak. I I think uh, combining psychedelics with music uh, provides <laughs> those moments, and uh, especially yep. For, yep. For, for for me, especially mushrooms, a higher doses of uh, of, of of mushrooms. Uh, combined with really good music and my, 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 my taste for music on mushrooms is very different you you really want the, the sophisticated uh, the, the the high level stuff that is really out there some um, stuff like um, what's this guy's name he's from England uh, he's he's one of the modular dudes um, also a real nerd. His album was called Alenia. Okay. Um, fuck, he's... Oh, oh, yeah, Floating Points. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, so something like some like Floating Points or some, 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 some really good, intricate ambience, stuff like that. Uh, just interesting music. Um, when I'm... When I'm uh, yeah, I'm... Uh, when I take mushrooms uh, with, with the purpose of... Uh, of, of Having a sort of a uh, synesthesia type of experience where I also see music, um, that I think that takes me pretty close to you know that peak experience. Mm. Mm. No, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, so, some of my sort of peak experiences have been in very sort of similar situations, slightly different psychedelic. But yeah. You, ayahuasca, ayahuasca or, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. The ayahuasca ceremonies can also be incredible because you're so so open. Oh my god! Oh my god! Yeah. And like the the first ceremony I ever partook in was hilarious because I literally got I, I I remember thinking like oh you know I've done everything I need to do in music and I don't really feel like I've got so much more to learn. And then the first ayahuasca ceremony, it was just geometric patterns and yeah. ratios and like because it was a very particular kind of um strain that that i was working with at that time and it was based on the acacia plant which is obviously australian you know uh, very indigenous that kind of thing and mm -hmm. uh, somebody in the ceremony was playing a, a didgeridoo and i have never had synesthesia like it in my life i literally could see every waveform come out of this didgeridoo wow. And wow. the interaction between that frequency and that set of harmonics 
with yeah. the position I was at and what was flowing through my body at that time, it just deepened and intensified the experience so much that yeah. I, 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 I seriously, I still have no recollection of where I went for like the five hours afterwards. And, and, I, and I, sorry, go on. So, so yeah, and so it's, it's something I would definitely recommend if you are uh, if you're mentally stable. Um, to allow yourself these occasional reset uh, opportunities where you just, you know, get into an altered state of uh, consciousness and heightened awareness and, uh, and, and you know, get rid of the cogwebs in your head and just simply, you, you, it's like pushing the reset button and I often feel so refreshed when I'm, you know, when I'm worn out after producing too much and I just need, need to, or from touring, and I just need to reset. And this is what I do at home. And it's it's you shouldn't do that at a party because of the party you're simply going to party. But um, at home, you can really have that journey inwards. Uh, yeah. No, absolutely. It, it's about it's about the deep work. That's yeah. what it's yeah. really about, you know, for me. And you know, I've I've taken now nearly a year and a half off any form of psychedelic because. As, as you know, because obviously we're good friends and you kind of know my sort of like, you know, life path over the last few yeah. years. Like it was pretty intense for a while. Yeah. And, and it needed to be. Uh, but with that comes an inevitable pumping of the brakes. And, Absolutely. And integration. So integration. So let that happen. And actually the year and a half I've taken off has resulted in this platform being built. Yeah. Yeah, you're in a great place now. You know, exactly, yeah. So now I'm feeling like, now I've been in lockdown for three months and stuff, I was like, yeah, maybe it's maybe it's time to blow the cobwebs off a little bit, you know? Maybe it's time to do that, you know? And, and again, it's amazing because what you're actually doing is like, as you were saying, you, you're becoming that empathy channel because it's amazing that when you're in those types of situations, how effortless it becomes to kind of get out of your own way. Yeah. And allow sure. that process to take place and happen. You know, it's amazing. Now, just what I don't do is... like, we're not we're not condoning the use of psychedelics here. We're just translating our own experiences. Yes, we do. <laughs> <laughs> Good job. This is happening in a private group right now, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, but uh, um, I never make music on drugs. Yeah. And, and and also, it's the psychedelics are the only stuff that I do. Mm. So, yeah, uh, same. same. I'm for yeah. very deep, deeply specific reasons as well. It, exactly, know? it's medicine. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. You know, it's there for for self development. It's there absolutely. to fulfill yeah. your potential and to connect and reconnect and remain in alignment with what your purpose really is exactly center and also uh yeah um refresh absolutely yeah absolutely uh, so yeah obviously that's a that's pretty big in terms of self-care right you know what we were talking about before and, and neil's got questions here about neil actually for context is our in-house health and wellness expert Oh, great. So, yeah, he's actually, he runs the wellness programs for uh, festivals like Anjuna Deep uh, Explorations. Uh, and he's a very, very good friend of mine. We actually did our sound therapy uh, qualifications together. So he's obviously asking about your self-care. You've mentioned sleep and obviously these resets and stuff as well. So, you know, post-gig, how do you, like, rebalance after you've been on tour or the the touring schedule has been quite intense like what what does that kind of you know return back to the center look like it, it it's difficult it's first of all it's just uh, uh excessive amounts of you know catching up on sleep after a weekend i think the best self-care you can do is simply plan your touring schedule in a way that doesn't burn the candle on both ends uh, especially when you th that's difficult when you're just getting out there and making a name for yourself uh, you you want to make you know you want to make hey you want to uh, you want to do as much as possible but uh, but uh, and I would definitely recommend everybody to explore your limits 
Mm. But you'll sooner or later reach them. And uh, I think it's extremely important for me, at least, to on the road simply say no to a lot of things. No drinking, no drugs. Um, um, often, if I if I need time to sleep in between, you know, in between gigs, I skip dinner. I just buy something in a supermarket across the street from the hotel and just uh, have dinner by myself. And just, you know, you can explain it to the promoter in a nice way that you're not going to have dinner with them. Um, but yeah, you want to watch your sleep hours like a hawk. You want to plan your flights in a way that, uh, um, that they support your natural sleeping rhythm. So that after a show, you still have five or six hours of sleep, and then you fly out to the next destination in the, in, in the late afternoon, if possible. You know, so it's the, what really kills me the most is uh, yeah, playing three three shows in three different countries, and then being on the road all day long, arriving at ten in the evening. You know, having one hour of nap, then going to the club, playing coming to the hotel six in the morning and then having to catch a flight at eight thirty. Um, so you have like another half hour of just, you know, uncomfortable sleeping and waking up, um, not even knowing where you are. And, and, and it plays tricks on you because uh, after a while, uh, I can feel that memory loss is starting to become uh, an, an issue. And I will simply not recognize the face of a person that I've had dinner with mm. three days earlier. Mm. It's like, warrior i've never seen you oh no we had dinner like the other day so some if that happens to an artist if you approach another artist and they don't recognize you it often is simply that it's, it's just a memory loss thing and it's not that they're arrogant or anything you know it's like uh mm. it's 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 tough and um uh, uh, you simply have to learn from your mistakes you know, some i'm trying to do but I have no illusions. Uh, touring life is unhealthy. Uh, and the only way to do it well is to not do it too much, I think. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, the uh, the last three months for you must be a very uh, interesting process for you. It's, it's been good. It's been needed in a way, you know. I was, I was pretty burned out. Uh, so, uh, from a sleep and wellness perspective, it's very welcome. Mm. And other other than sleeping and planning my tour as well, um, I try to eat clean. Mm -hmm. Difficult on the road, but I, you know, I even bring food on the road, mm. uh, and uh, I try to avoid carbs and sugar. Uh, stick to proteins and uh, and vegetables. Um, I, um, yeah. What else do I do? Um, yeah, and during the week, I have a dog, so we walk every day, always in nature, um, go to the gym, basic stuff, you know. It's, I, I don't feel I need to do too much, just basic maintenance, mm -hmm. steady, no after parties ever. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll skip that as well. It's just, that's a trap too. Because the after parties is where you make your friends and where you meet the promoters. And so many artists have the feeling like, I need to be here to, to network. But this is also where the drugs are waiting for you. And then once you're part of that, it's easy, it's easy to overdo it and to, uh, and to throw away a lot of what you've built up. Mm in years and years of hard work in the studio and that's the thing and it's like it's context as well because i found that because i i got even though i you know, don't take drugs and never have in terms of like you know the typical rave drugs if you will you know i was always a fixture at the after parties because of that whole networking thing and, and actually i it dawned on me pretty quickly after one year of going to the miami winter music conference i came back thinking i'd made all sorts of business deals and you know made all sorts of great connections and again you get home and no one can remember agreeing to anything <laughs> um, you know people don't even remember meeting you so yeah. it's like well context is king right you know you have to meet these people in the correct context and yeah. there's no sure. use force in these things for sure for sure so uh james is asking here what is the average time it takes for you to complete a track and do you 
do you sit on the track before you decide to release it or is it pretty much get it finished get it out the door um average time the better the track the faster so my my the big hits I'll, i i usually make them within one or two days mm-hmm. uh sometimes i have to work on a track you know i have to will it for instance if you have to make a remix of a track that in itself has very little in it mm-hmm. very little, you know there's just no usable parts and you have to you have to kind of wrestle every last bit out of those tracks and it can take me maybe a week it rarely takes longer than a week mm. i know that when i'm i haven't got anything substantial after a week i usually bail and i just leave it and then maybe i, I mean i save everything and then maybe i can use a, a part for a remix or another track you know so I will, they'll become they'll become spare parts uh, the, the the unfinished projects um as far as uh, uh, holding back tracks goes like right now i've made a lot and i'm consciously holding some stuff back because i want the stuff to hit the market when everybody's dancing again mm. um but normally it's usually it's made to order i make it i send it uh, i usually i already know where a track is going to be released before i even finish it because i promised a label an ep or something and then you you send it and it, uh, they, know, they know they have to they have to have the track at a certain date because the release is three months after that mm-hmm. so i'm I'm usually working uh to meet deadlines mm. yeah. now it's interesting isn't it because like you say i mean i've spoken to a number of producers recently who are three months into this whole situation if you will are now starting to kind of feel like they're struggling a little bit for inspiration because it's like I'm writing this music and where is it gonna go exactly? What is it gonna be played on somebody's live stream? You know, like I'm not really sure, like what the end result of this is, so to speak. So it's interesting to hear you that you hear that you're banking tracks, so to speak, yeah. and kind of sitting on them. And again, like that wouldn't be the case in regular times. I'm sure you'd be getting them scheduled and getting them out there. But, yeah, you know, in this type of situation, I think some patience is definitely required. And it's also good to have some, you know, exclusives for DJ sets. I love having a few mm-hmm. tracks. Also, sometimes, you know, tracks that I think they are good, but they've failed or remixes where, uh, you know, I'm really happy, but somehow they got rejected by uh, the artists. Mm. Secretly, that often makes me happy because then I have something that is exclusive and that no one else has, you know. So sometimes holding back some stuff or some slightly unsuccessful bits and bobs, but still usable tracks, you know, and then they they make great exclusives. And I, I and I realized that the, the the longer I'm in this game and the more I, I play and produce, the easier it is for me to make the music that I need for my set and the harder it is for me to find the music from other people. Mm. So um, it's it's almost easier for me to write a track than to buy one. Mm. Mm. No, it's interesting. Great stuff. So obviously, I think some of the stuff we've already kind of covered, just looking through the questions, but obviously, you know, you know you're not a, yeah. a, a yeah, classically yeah. trained musician and stuff. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick uh, a few little kind of key ones out here because uh, I'm just sort of conscious of time as well. Um, how do you know when you finish the track? Um, when it works and I'm out of ideas, I let it go. And then, then it's then I test it. If I'm not a perfectionist, uh, it needs to have a certain level, and uh, I, I just know that. Uh, uh, it's really important at some point to just let it go um, and not to get lost in details because, you know, you're wasting time that you could use on a next project. Um, when I'm almost there, I'm there. 
yeah. <laughs> you know so so uh, uh because because i know that if i'm saying i'm finishing it when i'm 100 percent happy i'll never finish it mm -hmm. so i'm raising the bar a few percents and uh it's easy to let go and and surprisingly almost always the, the, the track will you know work yeah. and uh, yeah so yeah, it's it's like sometimes you just have to ask yourself, is this good enough? Yeah, it's good enough. Bye bye. Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah, and like you say, yeah. if you run out of ideas, then again, yeah. there's no point yeah. forcing more stuff down the tube. You know? Yeah, yeah. You may as well just move on to the next thing. And and again, if it was still not exactly what you wanted it to be, maybe later on, there's some things that you can go and revisit. I mean, yeah. I've written entire tracks, decided never to release them. And then later on down the line, gone back and then picked the bones out of it and then recontextualized and refresh those parts into something completely new. Yeah, exactly. No, totally, totally. So, right, here we go. Uh, this is a good question because we were talking about demos and stuff as well. Uh, do you have any advice for uh, getting demos listened to without a personal link to the label? I've heard a lot of time the demo emails are not checked much. So if not using these, what would you do or what would you recommend as the best way to contact labels? Mm, well, do your homework. Uh, uh, often, first of all, certain A&Rs are better than others. Mm -hmm. They'll listen to everything. So uh, focus on labels. If you're completely unknown, Focus on labels that break a lot of new artists. Mm. That's already a good sign that uh, the NR is interested in in, 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 in fresh blood. Uh, then, then make sure that uh, the email is friendly, personal, two sentences, not a WeTransfer link, but a SoundCloud link or a Dropbox link where people are not forced to download, but they can immediately listen to it. Mm. Now make sure that the demo is two, three tracks, just your two, three best tracks. Keep it short. Um, and then if you don't know anyone, try to take advantage of your circle of friends. Well, maybe they do know someone. Maybe they can give you that introduction. You know, always ask for introduction. I'll, I'll, I'll introduce people quite regularly. You know, I will, uh, like, I'll, I'll, people ask me, can you introduce me uh, uh, to the guys from Compact or Afterlife? And uh, if I, if my, if the music in my, I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to be the gatekeeper. Mm. I, I will often do that. So, um, Ask for introductions to friends who are in it, you know, because everybody has a friend who has already released something on a on a slightly bigger label, you know. Mm. Start there, yeah. um, and then uh, also what helps is be original. Mm. Send a, a demo out with the mail, and do something, you know, something personal with it. Mm. Um, you know, um, <laughs> send a USB stick with a with a, with a handwritten postcard or something something nice. You know, that's yeah. already that, that that totally separates you from the from the herd because I've never gotten I'm never getting anything sent by mail. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody sends out emails, and a lot of people you can just tell they're they're sending it out to a hundred a uh, hundred contacts, and they hey there. When I hear that, hey there, it's already. I'm not. I'm not interested anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I know it's not personal, but I'm also. You know, I'm, I just don't want to be on the receiving end of a cluster bombing. Mm. Oh, totally, without a doubt, without a doubt. And it reminds me actually of like back in the day. One of the ways that you could break talent back here. And I'm talking back in the days when we used to do like mix cassettes with like you know it was yeah. all vinyl back in the day. Yeah. The likes of uh, you know music magazine. Uh, would run these like bedroom bedlam competitions. Oh and, yeah, I remember those. Yeah, 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 yeah. And like honestly, some of the stories I've heard about like what people would send in in order to try and like make a difference is unbelievable. Like you know, they'd send like cakes to people, 
they'd send like you know gifts or like you know weird handwritten stories like it'd come in a pop-up book all these kind of strange weird tactics in order to like you know just get them through the door basically like yeah, yeah great I always remember one one there. They, they gave someone an honourable mention because it was like, yeah, your mixtape wasn't any good, but the cake that you sent was delicious. Like, that. <laughs> yeah, we really appreciate that. We we enjoyed listening to your mixtape over that cake and a, a cup of green tea, you know. So, um, I mean, there's so many more questions here, but I want to try and make them. So. Yeah, if I'm fine. Yeah, you can, right. I mean, okay. So here's one from Ash Taylor. What advice does Patrice have for artists that are going to, how are they getting to a point where they're consistently making solid tracks, getting great feedback from other artists, have a strong vision of who they are and what they want to achieve? Is it just a case of keep making music and then sending it out? Is self-releasing in this scene worthwhile? Uh, I mean, Ash is doing some amazing stuff at the moment and he's very consistent, but it's, it's how he makes that next step. So... I mean, it sounds fairly similar to a position where you were at like a while ago. Um, yeah, I mean, when you say something sounds great, are people begging you for the track? Because mm -hmm. that is the that, that is that is the test. When people are actually coming to you, what is this? And asking you, can I have it? That's when the stuff is great. Um, you know. Uh, so when you, when you are happy with it, uh, it, it, it can be good, but good isn't great. Mm. And, 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 and only great will actually really make a difference. Mm. Uh, and, and great will cause a stir, it will cause a reaction, and you'll know it, and people will ask you for the music. Mm. And... Uh, um, and when you're at that level, it will be much easier to shop a track. Mm. Honestly, for me also, you can you can have a big name, uh, but if you send out a mediocre demo, um, well, okay, for a big name, a lot of labels will still say yes because uh, uh, they know they it, it's, it's they book it as a marketing expense and as a stepping stone. But uh, if you're like at that, just not quite well known uh, level and your track is just good labels will not take the risk mm. because there is so many artists out there who are good you have to be great mm. uh and 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 that is just simply uh being honest to yourself have this have a, have, a, have a process in place that keeps you uh, getting better and better and better and uh, and often you're simply one idea away from 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 that breakthrough so yes you have to you have to keep going but if you have a track uh, let the dance floor be the judge how good that track is mm -hmm. you know it needs to it needs to cause a reaction and when it causes a reaction you will sell the track rather easily mm -hmm. No, it's good advice, man. Definitely good yeah. advice. <clears throat> and that's the thing, it's about quality control more than anything, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and and, 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 and people are often too happy, but the dance uh, too too easily satisfied, but uh, the dance floor doesn't lie. Mm. You know? Uh, if it has to stand the test of the dance floor and when the dance floor explodes, then you have gold in your hands. And then the thing you have to worry about is to not give away gold to a label that is moi. When you could actually shop the same track with a with a better label that could actually make a difference. So mm. once you have that gold in your hand, you want to aim high and then you work your way down. Mm. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, be strategic. Use your brains. Uh, give that track to... A friend who is playing in front of another DJ who is even more known, who could open you another door and tell them to give them that track or whatever, you know, it's just, uh, uh, yeah, a, a bit of hustle is required, but I'm telling you, 
the mo the better your music is, the easier it is uh, it will be to sell it. Mm. And uh, uh, if you have a bomb, you'll send out four demos, you'll get four responses. They all will, they'll all sign your track, and uh, then it's uh, it's a uh, a seller's market. No, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, that's the exact story of yeah. my own EP on Bedrock last year. Yeah, it was literally the tracks were sent to John. Within an hour, I got an email back going, do not send this music to anyone else. These tracks are mine, and I will kill you if you give them to anyone else. And I was like, okay. And then the morning <laughs> after, I get a contract. Yeah. It's like, okay, okay. That, that, that's, how, that's when you know you've got it. And it really yeah. is, like, not to sound reductive, like, that's really what it's about. That's really the reality of it. No, amazing, amazing. So uh, Mark Craven's asking a question here from Sydney. Oh, oh yeah, hi Mark, if you're there. Yeah, he, well, he probably I'm will be. Doing good. Be yeah, we had we had some really good times in Sydney last time I was there. Oh, dude, I mean, Mark is a, a very good friend of mine from back in the day in Liverpool, so he's also buzzing about football at the moment. Uh, awesome. But yeah, 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 I mean, just just brilliant to be over there with him. Uh, he says, "I hope you're keeping safe and well." Uh, on a scale of one to ten, and ten being the worst, how bad was the late coffee you had in Sydney last year? Um, yes, I read that question. I cannot even remember the coffee anymore. <laughs> <laughs> There's that memory was, loss you were talking about earlier, right? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Pro it, yeah, it was probably you know because Australia, the coffee in Australia is incredible. Mm. Uh, so. Let's put it this way: the cup didn't make my top ten, so I don't remember, and I don't, and, and I don't remember the mediocre and the bad stuff ever. It just goes out of the system. Well, exactly. Um, it's the same with probably tracks, hit, right? Probably hit the spot at the time, you know. Yeah, exactly. Because yeah. <laughs> on a more serious note, you first flew onto my radar when Raw was released in two thousand and eight, yeah. and uh, he says it still tan stands the test of time today. Uh, he would love to know where the inspiration of that track came from and some of the oh. techniques used in creating this absolute monster happy accident um i created that track in really literally 20 minutes mm -hmm. uh, all i wanted was um uh, i was i had a dj gig that night uh, in amsterdam and i just needed you know I, at the time i was making this a lot of like dj tools mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, yeah, I'm going to make a few tools. And this was one of them. Uh, the technique I used is just loaded a sample with a lot of attack into the simpler. And then uh, looped it and just, just uh, changed the length of the automated, the, 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 the change of uh, uh, length of the loop. And then it's like uh, an engine noise. That's like ding, 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 Mm. That's how you get it in, and then just amplify the sounds with a, with a few uh, white noises and a little bit of reverb and uh, and a drum explosion here and there. It was just it really it, start to finish. If that thing cost me two hours, uh, that would be a lot. Mm. So it was just a happy accident and a tool. When I played it, that was one of those few tracks where I really had a. a an immediate massive reaction and people coming to the to the DJ booth wanting to know what it is and then you just know oh wow this is I don't know how, how I did it and obviously I couldn't replicate the same sort of success for many years afterwards yeah uh, so I just locked into it uh, but uh, yeah happy accident amazing amazing so you what are your favorite Sebastian's asking this one there's Sebastian Tamayo uh what's your favorite what are your favorite fx plugins and if uh obviously talking about ableton do you use any interest in max for live plugins um i'm not a super nerd so uh my favorite uh, plugins i use very few plugins and i keep reusing the same ones which also helps me with the consistency of a sound mm -hmm. um favorite plugins i've written them down uh, Sugarbuzz Effectrix, mm -hmm. which is a, a glitch plugin, which I love to randomize uh, uh, um, drum loops, uh, just to just or to also randomize um, uh, 
leads, etc. Just to, if something feels a little static, I pull out the effect tricks and I can just make it more, more alive, a bit more, you know, it's just, you know, it just adds a little bit of fun and a little bit of uh, surprise into uh, almost any sound. Um, then um, I use um, the Sound Toys, Crystallizer, Echo Boy. Um, I use a lot of uh, uh, the native plugins from uh, um, um, Ableton. Mm -hmm. EQ8, I think, is an incredible uh, uh, equalizer, very flexible. Mm -hmm. I use it as a, a high-pass filter, low-pass filter, and equalizer uh, on almost every channel. Mm -hmm. um, the delay which used to be ping pong delay and a simple delay is now mm -hmm. one delay, which is, is a great usable delay. So those are my uh, go-to plugins. Um, um, I use the simpler a lot. Mm -hmm. um, I use Omnisphere as a, as a synth plugin a lot. And for my... Um, Test Masters, I used uh, Fab Filter Pro, what's it called? FF Pro 2, mm -hmm. which, which is a really transparent uh, limiter that just makes stuff louder. Um, simply with that limiter alone, uh, on the master, I can approach the final master that I get back from the label 90%. Mm. So it, it makes my test tracks much more playable and, and you know they're already dominant mm. which also underscores how important it is to have a good mix mm. the mix is more important than a master if the mix is right i can make a track i can master the track so well in within two or three minutes that it will hold up well against other tracks mm. Mm -hmm. Just using that Fab Filter uh, uh, Pro to uh, limiter, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, Max for Life plugins. Rarely use any of them. The ones that I use are the LFO, which is so useful mm -hmm. to randomize automation to just you know automate automate our other par parameters. And I use the envelope follower. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's the thing. It's like the sim the simpler the tools, the more yeah, utilitarian yeah, yeah. and the more flexible they're going to be, right? Yeah, the, the envelope follower is great to uh, to hook up to uh, um, to a high pass or low pass filter, and then you can you can kind of use it like um, like a side chain uh, uh, like a side chain compressor, but mm -hmm. instead of compressing you you filter out uh, the low pass frequency or the high pass frequency mm. Mm. No, that's amazing no, that's great stuff yeah i feel like we've uh i was just looking at the comments here i think we've pretty much covered everything in the course of the last couple of hours dude yeah great yeah we've covered yeah. a hell of a lot of ground you know i was uh i was expecting a good talk but then you know when we said the left turn into mushrooms and psychedelics i knew we were really huh. getting somewhere nice no, it's yeah been great man it's been really really good and and again just you, you know you're such an inspiration to so many within the group and it's yeah. just been great to kind of make this happen and you know as i say it always makes me reflect on sort of our friendship as well and how kind of instrumental you've been uh, i'm equally grateful you. you know for the opportunity also you know um, first of all yeah you you you're a brother to me uh, but also, uh, I think I think it's important for you know what you do, and uh, also for me to 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 um, to pass to, to pass the torch on, you know, to uh, to share the knowledge and to to enable other people. Because I'm now, you know, I'm in my 40s. Uh, the stuff where you, the time, the age where you start to enable other people becomes way more important uh, mm -hmm. because. I've I've already done it, you know. I've uh, I've traveled the world a few times, and uh, uh, now 
helping others is just becoming a more and more uh, instrumental part of my life and it already is of your life which is you know it's such a it's such a worthwhile journey to be to, to be on and mm. and uh, i try also to use my social media in that way i mean um, it's, it's it's not super consistent because um, i just don't like to be online a lot you know uh, but um yeah also with, with my social media i always try to share what I've learned and what has helped me, uh, whether it's music or something more in the in the mental, uh, spiritual uh, realm. Mm. No, that's the thing. It's like you know, that's one of the things that I've I've always been so impressed by, and what I've really resonated with you, both on a personal level and then professionally as well. Is you know, you kind of embody what this platform is all about, which is becoming the best version of yourself, yeah, as well as the best artist that you can be and actually you can't do one without the other and i and i think the name make a transition uh is really great because what it actually describes is the caterpillar becoming a butterfly mm. and, and, and 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 i and i love to see that development in an artist and i love it in particular when you have an artist who's been at it for many years and suddenly has a breakthrough into something that takes it to a whole new level. Mm. So I remember this guy from Manchester, maybe you know him, Andy Stott. Mm -hmm. When Andy was a, mostly a dub techno artist, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden he started making this, around 2011, he started making this really slow techno. So he had this album called Luxury Problems. Mm -hmm. And for me, that was such a, such a groundbreaking way of, uh, uh, of, 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 of making techno. And, and, and I thought it was so inspirational to see an established artist change his game completely because it gives me hope that I won't be stuck doing the same thing or maybe also find a, a new nugget of gold, you know, and then and, and maybe, you know, take my game to another uh, level as well. And, I'm, and, and just as much I enjoy that with any artist that, suddenly steps up his game and i hope many of you guys are you know uh, are in the process of doing that by simply mm -hmm. being here and make a transition absolutely absolutely well dude this has been an absolute honor to, to have you on this evening likewise and you. Uh, you know you know let's uh, let's see what what else we can come up with Catch new episodes of Beyond the Studio every single week right here on YouTube or listen on Apple Podcasts, Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts.